Hello, in this video I'm going to be looking at a file format I've been using for about 15 years. Well, it's not precisely this one, but it's a version of. It's modified and matured over time. It's a file format that I quite like because it's easy for humans to edit, it's easy for the computer to interpret, and it's easy for the programmer to use. As such, it's always been my go-to for serialising and deserializing class hierarchies, configuration files, and, well, anything else that I want to make persistent. When I first started to think about doing this video, one of the challenges I faced was coming up with a compelling, yet simple and rich enough demonstration to justify the use of save files in the first place, and I didn't want to take up most of the video time writing a bit of software, which ultimately wasn't necessary. What I decided to do instead was use some previous software from a video called Polymorphism where we developed a very simple CAD-like package. And here it is, you have a grid, and we can zoom in and out. If I press the B key, we can draw a box. If I press the C key, we can draw a circle. If I press the L key, we can draw lines. And if I press the S key, we can draw splines. And it was interesting because all of these shapes inherit from a common base shape, and polymorphism sorts it all out. I actually found the whole thing quite an addictive thing to use and ended up spending far too much time drawing pointless logos like this. But it's ready to go, it's very simple to use, the code is simple and available, and there's a video explaining all about how it works in the background should you need it. But most importantly, it had no way of saving or loading the data in the drawings. And so, for this video, I've taken the original polymorphism video code, but I have modernised it slightly. Firstly, it's going to use a transformed view to handle the panning and zooming. I've removed some of the old raw pointer stuff into, well, more modern smart pointer stuff. And to the base class that represents the shapes drawn on the screen, I've added some save and load functions. Other than these customizations, the code is as we left it in the previous video. It's entirely up to you if you want to watch that video before watching this one. I don't think it's entirely necessary uh, if you can forgive a bit of pre-made code in the hope that this video can be a little bit more expedient. After all, this is not a video about polymorphism, more so a video about how do we save things to a file. So there's the program we're going to add some long-term persistence to. Let's have a look at how the data file is constructed. For this video, we're going to create yet another file format. We could use JSON, we could use YAML, we could use whatever else is currently fashionable and used by all of the other bits of software these days. There are some advantages to rolling your own, particularly if you want to learn about how this stuff works. But my file format is very, very simple, easy to parse, and has proven to be quite robust. The OLC data file is a hierarchical structure consisting of nodes. It's fundamentally a tree, and in its simplest form, a node has a name, and it has some sort of container of strings. Let's assume our file contained the text pos equals 23, 54. So the position of something is at location 23, 54 in the X and Y. The name of the node is pos, and the container of strings will hold two additional strings. One will be 23, and one will be 54. The file format requires that we specify a separator token, which in this case is a comma. We have to make note later on when we're reading in the file that we don't have to just have numerical concepts like this, it could be a string, in which case the separator token is part of the string. So quotes form a part of our specification, but we'll look at that in a bit more detail later. To turn the data file into a tree-like structure, I've added another container to my node, and this container stores nodes. So if we take a similar example as before, we can structure this differently. We can now have a node called pos, but the container of strings is empty. Instead, the container of nodes consists of two nodes, one called x and one called y. And these individual nodes can have the containers of strings populated with the data. We've now got two ways of expressing the same thing. Arguably, the way at the bottom here is more verbose because we've labelled the individual contents. This will take longer to read and could be a bit more clumsy for the human too. That said, to interpret the example up here, our program needs to know in advance 
that the pos object is perhaps a coordinate and it should interpret it as such when it's reading it in. And this is why I like to think that my data file type is a bit of a middle ground between a binary format file and a text format file. It still requires the program know what to do with the data and how to read it in, but the way that we present it to the program is human readable. Because each node owns a container of nodes, then each node in that container of nodes also owns a container of nodes, which also own a container of nodes. It's a bit like the quad tree in this instance, it just keeps going and going and going. And that allows us to have a very deep nested hierarchical structure in the file. Now, even though all of the nodes have a name, it's not very useful for a node to know its own name. Rather, it's better for the node to know the names of its children. So I'm going to bin off the name parameter and specify that this bottom container is in fact a map of strings to nodes. And this string here will be the name of the node. And this container could be, well, pretty much any container, but I'm going to go with a good old vector. And that is all there is to the OLC data file format. When we start coding it, I'll flesh out a few more details here and there, just to aid with the human readability aspect of the file format. Each node only stored information as strings. There's no type information at all. Which is unusual because you'd think for a C++ based language you would want types. Well, type information only applies to binary files. For text based files it needs to be implied somehow. And in an OLC data file we only have three data types. We have strings, integers, and real numbers. Unlike other text file formats, the program reading in this information needs to know in advance what type of type it's going to be using. Now sticking to just these basic three types is great because they're highly interchangeable. When my program reads in the object name, it knows it's looking for a string, in this case Javid. When it's reading in the object called age, it knows it's looking for, well, an integer, 24. And likewise, when it's reading in height, it knows it's reading in a real number. It could be casting that to a double or a float. That's on the programmer to ensure that the correct data type is being read. But just to make life a little bit easier, I don't want the program to collapse if they get it wrong. Therefore, the data structure will do on-the-fly conversions. If we attempted to read in age as a real number, then it will read in the value 24.0. And likewise, if we attempted to read in the height as an integer, it would simply just read in 1. Since a string can't naturally become a number, if we attempted to read in the name as a number, it would simply be 0. By keeping nodes very simple and using minimal types and allowing nodes to have children which are also nodes, we now have a very powerful tree-like hierarchy. And this is exactly the type of hierarchy you need when you have any kind of object-oriented programming system attempting to serialize its data structures. Hopefully it's evident that that file format is actually quite a simple one. It's a hierarchy, it's a tree. So let's get on with coding it. Now, there's a lot to get through in this video, so I'm going to code it quite rapidly. And on the whole, I'm going to avoid going into detail about how specific parts of the C++ standard library work. My data file is going to exist in a namespace, OLC utils. And I'm going to create a class called data file. This data file class is going to be the node that we saw on the slides. There is no top level class. And there's a very nice reason for this. It's incredibly flexible. And hopefully I'll demonstrate that a bit later. But I thought let's begin this by getting the really basic easy stuff out of the way first. The node consists of a vector of standard strings. I'm going to call that content. Now we will be populating the data file from a file, but we also need to be able to populate it from memory. After all, how would we get the contents into the file in the first place? This means I'm going to need some publicly accessible methods to access the contents of this node. Let's start with the most basic, set string. For the most part, nodes consist of a single value, but they can contain lists separated by commas. So just as a reminder, we can quite happily have a equals 1, 3, 7, 9, hello, something else. And so our setters and our getters need to be able to index a position in that list. 
By default, it's zero. It's the first element, because most of the time we won't have anything else. So the setString function must first check to make sure that the vector of these individual strings is large enough to store the string at the index provided. So I do this boundary check, and then I set the specific element in the list. If I've got a set string, I need a corresponding get string. Again, this just takes an index position, it's defaulted to zero, and returns the appropriate item in the vector, providing it exists. If it doesn't exist, we return an empty string. It's a bit of a silent, graceful fail. Unlike many other file formats, I don't want to have error states and error codes and exception throwing. And I just want to reiterate the point, that's because this file format anticipates that the program knows how to read it and write it properly. Since the vector of items that make up the list for a property of our node is all strings, our set real function, which allows us to set a decimal number, can abuse our set string function with the two string function of the double passed into it. And likewise, our get real function can do the same. If this has just become incredibly confusing, don't forget that everything inside our node is stored as a string. Not as a double, not as an integer, not as a float, just strings. And alongside our real functions, we're also going to have our integer functions, which now look very similar indeed. Set int and get int. I'm adding some convenience functions too. So if I want the number of elements in the list, get value count will return the size of the vector of strings. Let's just perform a quick test to see if that works. Here you can see I'm creating an object of type data file. That's a single node. And I'm using the set real function to specify a real number for that node. Even though I've specified the type when setting it, I can read it back as a string. Let's take a look and see if that works. And in the console window, I can see it says 3.141. So it has. Well, that's the easy bit out of the way, but let's add one simple operator overload which completely changes the dynamics of this data structure. Currently, our data file node doesn't have a method of storing children. It's not yet a tree or a hierarchy. But rather than just adding a container of children, I want to add a container of sorted children. And if this is sounding eerily familiar, it's exactly the same technique we used in my Programming a Retro pop-up menu system video. The child nodes are going to be stored in a vector which stores pairs named with the name of the child and the instance of the node itself. This is in effect the vector of child objects. Don't forget, the data file object doesn't have a name of its own, so we need something higher than the data file object to assign it a name. In this case, we actually do it twice rather inefficiently, because in addition to our vector, I'm also going to store an unordered map which maps a name onto an integer. This is quite a common pattern to exploit the characteristics and properties that are desirable from an unordered map, but retain the ordering of the items that are added to that map. Because the order is upheld by the index of the vector and the unordered map maps the name of the child node to that index. I've chosen to store the name of the child node in two locations at the same time, and this may seem like a bit of a mistake, but it's actually quite an efficient way of solving a problem we're going to face when we're reading and writing the files later. The traditional implementation of this pattern does not require this pairing of the name with the object being stored. Now, just like in the retro pop-up menu video, I'm going to override the array subscript operator as a way of accessing the particular child node for this data file. Firstly, we'll need to check that the name that's supplied actually exists within the map of objects. And in C17, we need to use the count method to do that, although more modern versions of C actually have a contains function. If the return count isn't zero, then a node with this name must exist within the map. So we can use that map and the name to return an index, when we can use that index to index the vector to give us the second element of our pair, which is the data file, the child node. If the count returns zero, then the supplied name didn't exist within the map. So we will add it by updating the map with that specific name and the index of our vector at its maximum size. 
and then we'll add to our vector the new pairing of name and data file object. Again, this is an attempt to allow the file format to fail gracefully in the event that the programmer searches for nodes that doesn't exist. I fully appreciate that to newcomers to C++ there's a lot to digest in this particular pattern and this operator overload, but I'll now show you the benefits of doing it this way. Given our data file node, I can create something new, some node. Quickly glancing at the slides again, we created a structure. Let's replicate this now. So some node name dot set string javid. Here I've created the three basic properties, string, integer, and real, with name, age, and height. The next element was a list of coding languages. Then finally, there was a subnode called PC that had some specifications regarding what computer I'm using. I've included the structure on the screen as well as how we've defined it using our array subscript operator. This is the most verbose way, but because we have this array subscript operator working on a tree of data files that have data files as children, we can exploit some nice things to make the syntax a little bit sweeter. For example, I can construct a temporary reference to everything that's called some node. So all of these can be replaced with a. I can chop even further. I can do the same again this time by taking the code element of our A node. And why not do something similar for the PC element? By using the array subscript operator in this way, we can construct new child nodes of a given data file, and we can chop them up at certain boundaries. It adds a lot of flexibility, and we'll see that this is very useful when we're working with object-oriented hierarchies later because we can get the objects to add themselves to the hierarchy. But is this working and how can we test it? Well, I'm going to run the debugger to this point. I'll zoom in so you can see this, but we can see that our data file currently consists of just one object. That one object is called some node. Let's have a look at that one object. That one object consists of five sub objects. Let's have a look at what those are called. We've got name, age, height, and code. Now, we happen to know that code is a container, so let's open that one up and have a look at its properties. Well, it's not got any subchildren, but it's got content. It's got three items of content, the three programming languages. Let's just close that down. The final object was PC, which was a subobject of its own, and it didn't have any content specifically, but it did have a children of its own. In this case, processor and RAM. So we can see we've created quite a nice memory structure, which is very searchable, very manipulatable, and very serializable. And I think that's what we'll do next. Well, the data structure is complete now, but it doesn't do any persistent saving of data. Let's add the ability to write data to a disk. I've added to the data file class this write function. The write function takes in a reference to a data file node, the on disk file name and two convenience functions which are defaulted uh, to tell me what type of indentation do I want and how are the lists separated. The first thing the write function will try to do is open a file with the file name provided. And if that was successful, I'm going to write the file contents and return true. Otherwise, I'm going to return false. Something went wrong with the file name or the permissions and we couldn't do it. This space here is obviously the critical part, but I want the data files to be able to write themselves using recursion. This function itself is not actually recursive. I don't need to pass in the file name each time, nor do I want to try and open a file for every child object in the hierarchy. Instead, I'm going to use a little lambda function called write. But unusually, this lambda function is fully specified. I'm not using the auto keyword. And that's because I need this function to be recursive and I can't have a recursive Lambda function, at least in C++ 17, because it's not deduced the return type by the time it needs to know it in order to do the recursion. This function takes in a reference to the data file node and the file stream that we've created earlier. So now after we've opened the file, I'm going to call this function 
pass in the node that we were supplied and the file stream that we've just opened. Assuming some top level data file node, we're only interested in writing out the node's children. Recall that children are individual properties, such as the name here, or they can have children of their own. If it's the former, then we just want to write to the file name equals Javid. If it's the latter, we want to write the name of the child and then open up some curly brackets and change the indentation. If the particular property doesn't have any children of its own, then it's just an assignment. So to the output stream, I'm effectively going to write name equals Javid. But obviously, I need to do this programmatically. Recall that I duplicated the storage of the property's names. Well, now it's time for that to be useful. The name of the property was the first element in the pair, followed by an assignment, followed by the content. In this case, it will be Javid X9, but we uh, need to do something a bit different for this. The content can, of course, be a list. At the very least, it's a list containing one element. So I want to iterate through all of the items in the list and write those. But we're going to find ourselves getting into trouble if we're not careful about handling string elements that contain the list separator. Let's, for example, assume that our property name is this, x9, javid. Is this a list of two strings? Or what if it was in quotes and was in fact a string containing a comma? We need to be able to differentiate between the two. All of our properties right now are in string format without the quotations. So it's fairly safe to assume that if a given property's value at a given index contains a comma or contains the separator token that we've chosen, then that token in its entirety needs to be wrapped in quotations before it's written to the file. Which is quite a mouthful, but that's what we're going to do. I'm going to see if the string that we're writing, the individual property for that element of the list, contains the list separator. If it did contain a comma in this case, then I want to write the property's value as a string, but surrounded in quotation marks. Else, I just want to write the value as a string without quotation marks. Now we've got an additional problem because we're writing out a list. Again, let's look at an example. Assume the property that I'm writing looks like this. If the property name only consisted of one element in that list, I don't need the comma. I also don't need a comma if it's the last item in a list either. So writing out the comma to the file needs to be carefully considered. For convenience, at the start of my write function, I'm going to create a string called s separator, which is the separator that we've chosen, in this case a comma, followed by a space. So that'll look quite nice when we write it out to the file. Before we entered the loop where we're writing all of the property elements in the list, I constructed this variable n items, which we can keep track of to tell us whether we're at the item at the end of the list. And I do that using this little uh, inline if, the ternary operator. If we've got more than one item left, then use our comma and space, otherwise just use an empty string. And each time we write an item to the file, I'm going to decrease my items count. It's amazing just how much effort you have to go to to make things look pretty. So far, we've only handled single line assignments. We've assumed that all of the properties we've written have had no children of their own, something we checked for by checking the child's vector of objects to see if it was empty. If we do have child objects, we now need to introduce braces, but we also need to introduce indentation. To the right function, I'm going to keep track of what level of indentation I'm up to with an nIndentCount variable. And inside my lambda function, I'm going to have another lambda function, which is just a utility function to create the string of the correct indent. By default, the indent is the tab character. And if we're at indent level 3, it will append three tab characters together to give me a string which is three tabs wide. That's why if you specified spaces to be your indent string, uh, you can have different levels of indents. Some people even like full stops. Since everything is going to be indented at this level or beyond, I can simply prefix my property output with this indent white space, calculated by the indent count. Once the for loop has iterated through the one or more 
options in the list, we're done with that line. So we can move on to the next one. And if this property had no children, it moves on to the next property. But let's see what happens when properties do have children. In this instance, I want to write the name of the property to the file. To make it look pretty, I'm putting it deliberately on a new line, so it's spaced out with a bit of white space in the file, and I'm adding the indent. And just as before, I write the first name. Now, there's no assignment in this case because it is the name of the property, and then on the next line, we have some open braces. So let's add those open braces and increase our indentation count. We can now take advantage of the fact that our write lambda function was fully defined. We're just going to write the data file at that indentation count. Once that write function returns, it's written the child and possibly all of its children and all of their properties. So we can simply close that brace and add a few more white space lines just to make the file look pretty. Whenever a data file node has finished being written out, we know that our indentation count is going to decrease. And believe it or not, that's it for writing out to disk, i.e. serialization. We take our tree-based hierarchy memory structure and write it out recursively to disk, taking into account assignments and braces and indentation. Let's give it a go. So here in our constructed data file, I now want to call our write function. Just to annoy Morris1138 on the Discord server, I'm keeping my read and write functions as static functions belonging to the data file class. I.e. they don't belong to a specific implementation, they just belong to the overall namespace of that class. OLC utils data file write. And we can pass in the data file node and the name of the file. I'll call this one testoutput.txt. I'm going to use the default parameters for the white space. So I'm going to compile this and run it and we'll have a look at what the output looks like. To the project, I've added this testoutput.txt file just so it's convenient for me to find it. And we can see the output that it's created is very similar to the slides that I showed earlier. Let's say I wanted to store a bunch of similar things. Here I've created a variable similar things and assigned it the value 10. And I'm going to iterate through this loop 10 times. I'm going to store in my file how many similar things I'm creating. And I will say a similar thing count dot set int n similar things. So I'm telling the file structure how many of these things am I going to write. And I'm going to have each of these things as a property. And I'm going to use string concatenation to make that even easier for me. So instead of similar thing count, I'm going to have similar thing plus standard to string i. And you know what? I'm going to wrap that in square brackets. Let's put that there and there. To which I'm going to set a random value. Set int rand. Let's run it. Look at our test output. And we can see we've got our variable similar thing count 10 and 10 random numbers, all of them individually named. Now, the fact that this is in square brackets is inconsequential. It's just a convenient way of looking at it from a human perspective. But we can also read in the values the same way. We've now successfully written to disk, and I think it's quite an elegant solution. Uh, we'll now start to read things from disk, and this is a bit more challenging because we have to parse all of the human-generated garbage that might be in our file. Just before we look at reading the file, I'd like to take a moment just to explain why we have an unordered map storing vector indices. Humans like to group things. Computers don't care. Whereas a human, we look at this, it's the definition of the number of elements in this array, and it's the array in a sequential order. In the unordered map, the parameters could be stored in any order at all, which would look horrific to us humans. In fact, this could be stored somewhere up here. It depends whatever the implementation of the unordered map deems efficient. Now we're getting to the point where we're reading in files, I'd like to be able to write out the file in the same order that it's read in. Because most of the time, it will be a human creating the file in the first place, and if they ever have to go back and edit it, I'd like it to feel familiar to them. It's just a nice thing to do. The read function is more complex, just because the nature of the problem it is trying to solve is more difficult. 
The files are written in a human-like way and we have to interpret all of that human garbage into something the computer can understand. However, it has a similar prototype to the write function. We're going to read into a specific node, notice the lack of a const qualifier, uh, from a specific file and we need to inform the read mechanism what the uh, separator is for lists. By default, again, it's comma. And we're going to open the file and return true if it's all good and we're going to return false if the file wasn't found. So really this is now an exercise in parsing. And I've chosen in this instance not to parse it recursively either because I think that adds more complexity than we actually need. We're going to be constantly reading in property names and property values. So I'm going to have two standard strings that store those. Occasionally I'm going to need to refer to these from strange places. So that's why I'm keeping them here. When we read in the file, even though we're constructing it in memory as a tree, it's actually a stack when read in line by line. We read a property and whenever we find an open brace, we push to the stack and then read a property, 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 and then push to the stack. So whatever's at the top of our stack at any given time is the parent node for the properties that we're currently reading. When we reach a close brace, we can pop the element off the stack, therefore going back to the correct parent. And by maintaining a stack in this way, we can ensure that all of the properties get added to the correct parent when we're constructing the tree. Now, because I like to be difficult and I like things to be controversial on the Discord server, I'm going to use a stack of reference wrappers. I don't want to bog this down with pointer syntax. You'll notice nothing we have done today has involved pointers. But at the same time, you can't really have a container of references. So I'm going to use this reference wrapper structure to, well, basically hide all of the pointer syntax. My stack is called stack path. It's effectively what I've just described. The top of the stack is the current node that we're processing. And I'm going to push into the, the root node of the data file. This is the one that's supplied. Even if you've not added any properties or children to a data file, just the fact that it exists means it's a node. So now it's time to read the file line by line and interpret it, moving our stack around as required. When you work with files of human readable text, they're often filled with rather pesky white space that gets in the way of your parsing. So I've created a trim function, which removes all of the white space at the beginning and the end of a line. This isn't Python. White space shouldn't be semantic. That was a daft idea, whoever came up with it originally. By its very nature, white space should be invisible. Once we've trimmed a line, we need to check that there's something there. It's not just an empty line. Empty lines are fine in our human readable file. They actually make it quite nice to group things together and have spaces in. Knowing that we've not got an empty line, we can start to try and interpret what it is we can see there. The first thing I'm going to look for is the presence of an equal symbol. The syntax of my file format tells me that property names can't contain equals. Therefore, if an equals exists, it's an assignment of some description. And on the left hand side of the equals is the property name and on the right hand side of the equals is the elements assigned to that property of which there could just be one or there could be a list of them. I will get the strings to the left and the right into prop name and prop value and I'll trim those as well just to make sure there's no unnecessary junk. We know that the prop value can consist of one or more strings of anything including things like strings inside commas and quotation marks. This could get very dirty very quickly. Therefore, we've little choice but to iterate through the string character by character, maintaining a flag as to whether we're inside quotation marks or not, and using all of that information to add elements to the property values list. So I will set up a small for loop that iterates character by character through the property value string, the right hand side of the assignments. In the comments for this file, I've added some extra detail which helps understand the situation here. And it's pretty good. So here we can see that a normal list might be defined as A, B, C, D, E, and F. But we could also have a list of A, B, C, and then D and E happen to be a string that contains a comma, an F. And that needs to be distinctive. Assuming we're not in quotations to start with, any character that is a quote will toggle our in quotes flag. Otherwise, the character is something meaningful to us. 
But if we're in quotes, I don't want to do anything other than append it to a currently accumulating token. It's in quotes. It doesn't mean anything other than append to a string that is building up. If I'm not in quotes, I need to keep an eye out for our separator token, the comma. So if the character is our comma, that means I've reached the end of the token. I can clean it up with the trim function, and I take our current address, which is the top of our stack, which yields a node. I use the array subscript operator of our data file node to give us the property. And I set the string of that property to the token value we've just accumulated at the location based on how many commas we've counted so far. Because each comma would indicate a new item in the list. At this point, I can reset the state of our token, and that's where I actually do the increment of our token count. If the character read this time was not in quotes and was not the list separator, then I just append it to the token. It's just regular good old string. This is the problem with doing parsing in videos. It can get quite complicated to follow what's going on. So that's why I've left it deliberately in braces with lots of comments. So you can have a look at the code at your own pace. It may well be the case that the human creating the file has actually put some mistakes in. They might not have closed off the quotations, for example, of a string. Now that means our parser here could be in a slightly confused state. We also have the final element of any lists. Typically, the token that's been accumulated is added to the correct node upon the presence of the separator. But that might not be the case if there are no separators, or it's the last element of a list. So we'll make sure that the token isn't empty, trim it, and add it to the right node. Right, all of this happened in the presence of the equal symbol, which indicated that that particular line was an assignment. If we don't have an equal symbol, then it can mean something else. Just having a name on a line with no assignment is invalid syntax for our file format, unless that name is followed by an open bracket. So let's check to see, does the line begin with an open bracket symbol? If it does, then the property name I've read previously is in fact the name of a node. And so I'll push that to my stack. If it's not an open bracket, then perhaps it's a closed bracket. If it is a closed bracket, then I've finished with that particular node. I can simply remove it from the stack. Or it's just a name floating in space. It's this PC here. That name floating in space is invalid unless it is followed by an open bracket. So you see how we've gone around in a bit of a circle here. It could be that the next line I read is that open bracket symbol. So I need to update my property name here. Now that seems like a lot and it is quite complicated and it's difficult to get across in video form, but parsing is always a bit like this. Really, most of the code here is just to handle breaking up strings into individual characters and making sure whether we're in quotes or not. The rest of it is just looking for braces to push and pop things from a stack. If you took all the comments out of this function, it's not very long at all. But let's test it. I'm going to create another data file object called test1. And I'm going to read into test1 from testoutput.txt, the file we've just created. This is one of the reasons I like the approach of having a static method to read. I don't like opening files in constructors, because if it fails, I've got no way of immediately being able to tell. Here I can, of course, do an if, and if that returns OK, then I'm safe to do things with the file data. Hopefully, this read function will then go and populate a data file structure with all of the contents from our test output file. To test whether this works, I'm then going to change one of the items. I'm going to add to the list of programming languages something I used to programming a long time ago. Test one, sum node code dot set string BBC basic. Now, what index am I writing that at? I don't want to overwrite what's already there, so I'm going to get that index. Auto index equals test one. Same thing, dot get value count. So that tells me how many things are in the list that's already there, and I want to append to the end of that list BBC Basic. And I'm going to write all of that to a second file. Let's compile it and see if it works. So if I look at the original test output file, we can see it's written again. Uh, this time it's removed the white space that we added earlier. 
And if I look at test output 2, it's the same file, but with the added language of BBC Basic. We've been successfully able to interrogate our data structure and modify it and write it back out to disk. As you can see, reading a file is a little bit more involved, but not really. Take out all of the comments, there's not much code there. There's one more feature left I'd like to add. One of the things I find that file formats like this frequently lack is the ability to include user comments in the data. This is fantastic for things like configuration files, where you might need quite a bit of descriptive text to explain what the properties are and the allowable values are, particularly if your user is going to be editing this file. So I've decided that in my data file format, lines that are prefixed with the hash symbol are comments, and they have to be whole lines. There's no sort of in-between comments, there's no end of line comments, it is just the whole line is a comment. And I'm not too fussed about preserving the formatting necessarily, as long as the comment is within the vicinity of the thing that it is trying to, well, comment about. Adding comments to our data file structure is quite trivial. I'm going to treat them like a special case of parameter. So I've added this is comment flag to our data file node. This just makes things a bit easier when we're reading and writing the files. So let's first have a look at how we read the files with a comment. When we were reading in the file line by line, the first test we did was is the line empty. If it wasn't empty, uh, then we went and parsed it. But now I'm going to check, well, if it is not empty, but the first character is the hash, remember it's been trimmed, then we know that this is going to be a comment. So I want to create a special data file node and set its comment flag to true. And then I'm going to do something a bit different. I'm going to take the current parent node that we're operating within and simply push to its list of child objects this data file that represents the comment. This ensures that the ordering of the comment is correct amongst the parameters. But it also means we can't index the comment via the map, which is good. It makes no sense to be able to do that. Writing out the file also requires minimal change. In fact, the only difference that matters is when we were writing out whether the property had an assignment or not. Now this is based upon whether the property is a comment or not. Because the property's name, or in this case the pseudo property's name, begins with the hash symbol anyway, I don't need to write it anywhere. It may be the case that the indentation gets a little bit messed up for our comments, but do you know what, I'm happy with that for the value that it adds. So let's take a quick look at this in action. In the output file that we've been creating automatically, I've now added in this user info and similar things comment. In the code, I've stopped it from overwriting that file, but I'm still going to read it in and write out to test output two. Let's do that. It's just run. And if I look at test output two, the comments exist in the same place. Good stuff. Right then, we can write to files, we can read to files, we can even put comments in files. Let's go back to the start of this video and add this data file utility to our OLC CAD program. I've gone ahead and already extracted the data file class that we've just created into its own file. It's now a utility class and added to the Pixel Game Engine repo. It's exactly the same as the file we've created in this video, except for a handful of quality of life functions which we'll see very shortly. Going right back to the beginning, in our base shape in the CAD program, I've added in four functions. Save and load are public and custom save and load are protected. Each shape consisted of nodes. Nodes were just 2D points in space. A circle would have two nodes, its middle point and a point somewhere along its radius. A spline would have three nodes, the two endpoints and a control point. The save function takes an incoming data file and it doesn't matter what that data file is, it adds a property to it, node count. How many nodes does this shape contain? I then want to write the nodes as xy coordinates, and I'm using this convenience function get indexed property. All this does is conveniently create the string node i, where i is replaced with the correct number, of course. And since this is the same property, I'm adding to it in list form, firstly the x coordinate, and secondly the y coordinate. All shapes have nodes, but the customized shapes, the boxes, circles, lines, etc., may have additional information. Therefore, I will defer to the derived classes to populate a data file node of their own. And I'm going to create that data file node on the fly called custom. So we will have an overall node for the base shape, 
and within that it will have a child node called custom, which will contain properties that those customized derived classes require. In the base shape, custom save and custom load are abstract. So let's just go and quickly have a look at one of these in line, for example. So here's custom save in line. All it's going to do is take the incoming custom node and add to it a property set string line. And that's because I need to know what type the shape is when I'm reconstructing it when I load it later on. And you'll find in this video that none of the custom load functions do anything. The shapes themselves don't have any unique properties worth loading. But let's have a look at the base shape load function. Loading is usually a bit more complicated than saving. Here we can see that the shape has a vector of nodes. Firstly, we need to clear that out. We can overwrite the shape. Then I want to count how many nodes does this shape have. It's possible that human editing of the files can introduce errors. So here I'm rather crudely just assuming that node count exists as a property. This will of course fail, well, it'll return zero. But I could check in advance to see if the node count name does actually exist within the map. And in the utility file, I provided the has property function that returns a bool if that's true, although I've excluded it from the CAD code just to keep it a bit clearer. Once I've got the number of nodes that I need to read in, I iterate through a for loop and I read in the node. And it's just almost the mirror opposite of what we did when we were saving. I'm going to get that particular index property and I'm making sure that it has got an X and Y coordinate in this instance. If it has got X and Y, I'm then reading those properties from the properties list. And I push the newly created node back into the vector of nodes. I then go on to call the custom load function, which we've seen in the derive classes for this application doesn't do anything. But if you're modeling off this for some other implementation of an object oriented hierarchy, uh, they may well do something special. So that's how the shapes save themselves. But let's have a look now how the application does actually perform a save. First, we create a data file. Now I like to add a root node, which means that all of the properties and all of the child nodes belong to something obvious in the file. I've called it OLC CAD. It's my file type, as it were. To that, I'm adding straight away the number of shapes I've got in my design. I also thought it'd be pretty cool. Why don't we save the current camera's location and zoom? So that way, when you load the file, it's exactly as you left it. So to do that, I create a child node called view, and it has offset and scales saved as coordinates, just like we've just seen. I then iterate through all of the shapes in my scene and I construct a special child node for them called shape with the index shape IDX. Once I've populated the structure, I can then write it out to disk. Saving is always easier than loading. When it comes to loading, the first thing we'll do is completely reset the scene. So we erase all of the shapes and set our program to a known state of idleness. Then I read in the data file from disk. I could check to see if it fails here, but I don't. I then read in the view. Now something a bit different here, thought it'd be some syntactic sugar. Instead of having lots of square brackets, I thought, well, why not use the period symbol to treat them like properties of properties of properties. And so in the data file, utility file, I've created this get property function, which does exactly that. It, it sort of looks for the period symbols within the name that's provided and works its way down to the appropriate property in the structure. So I can see now I can construct a property which is my OLC CAD file format. I'm particularly interested in the view and I want to see what the offset is and it's the X coordinate in that list. And so I can reconstruct the offset and the scale. Likewise, I can read in how many shapes are in this scene and then for each shape in the file. Now I know how many shapes there are. I can create a for loop and iterate through all of them, finding that shape's information. But we need to get the type of the shape before I can construct it as an object in my hierarchy. Fortunately, the shapes wrote this information themselves under the custom node. So I can just grab that as a string. Depending on what that string contains, decides on which object I create. And this was the whole point of the polymorphism video in the first place, is that we can create all of these different types because they all share a same base type and store them in a container of the, just that base type. Once we've created the shape, we need to populate it with its node data. So I just call the load function now on that shape, which will go away and lead the data file hierarchy as appropriate and construct the shapes properly. So let's take a quick look. I'm going to start by loading a application with control and O. 
and it's loaded up a predefined model. I'm going to go and modify that model slightly just by moving some of these points around. Let's move that circle up there, move its radius over there. And I'm going to move the view somewhere over here. And I'm going to save it with Control and S. I'll close the application. It's been serialized to disk now. We'll start up the application again. I'm going to draw a box and I'm going to draw a bit of a line. I'm going to zoom out over here and draw a bit of a circle somewhere. And then I'm going to press Control and O, which will load the file from disk. As we can see, it's loaded the model. It reset the camera view to exactly how I had it before. So I press Control and O again, exactly the same. Move it anywhere. Let's add a box and then move over here, Control and O. It just resets it to that known state. And so that's that. Admittedly, it's a very trivial example program demonstrating what I think is quite a powerful utility file. I've included the source code in a new folder called Utilities that exists within the Pixel Game Engine repository. You may also have noticed that that repository has undergone a lot of changes over the last couple of months. Even though I've not been making videos, I have been working quite hard pumping out code to the repo. So there's now an extensions folder and a utilities folder full of useful bits of code for your applications. If you've enjoyed this video, give me a big thumbs up, please. It's great for my ego. Have a think about subscribing. I am actually still on Twitter, if that's a thing. Come and have a chat on the Discord server, and I'll see you next time. Until then, take care.